Okay, how's everybody doing? Can you hear me all right? Thumbs up. Good, okay. So we've got a mix of people here from uh, different classes, but this unified topic I think is a really important one and uh, stuff I worked on a lot. So we'll get right into it. So the topic for tonight is communications for sustainable development. And this applies to getting, uh, letting people know what this stuff is all about conceptually. So those that are working on sustainable development 322 relates a lot to uh, making people aware of the impact on the biosphere um, and sense of place, this kind of thing, and social, social and ecological systems. And then um, for the finance folks, I mean, this is critical. Um, and I'm going to give a really good example, I think, of how this can work to our benefit uh, in establishing ways of communicating with those that really this stuff is just hasn't been on their radar for, for their whole careers in many cases. So um, communication is a really important part of mobilizing um, sustainable development in a lot of different ways. Okay, so um, I'm going to tackle this from a, a couple different angles. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is, is kind of pick up on where we were last um, last session because we kind of started to talk about this from a design standpoint. And um, I mean, the, one of the first things is um, trying to define what communication is. So communication is essentially trying to find common ground amongst different stakeholders uh, on a certain issue, hence the Latin word root of the word communis. But the, the real challenge is, uh, is trying to establish what works and what doesn't work. And I've tried a lot of different things and worked in a lot of different disciplines in design and communications. And some things have worked fantastically and other things have not worked um, so well. So that's why I say I want to talk about some successes and some failures. But at the end of the day, no matter whether it was a success or a failure, there's always something that I think jumped out at certain projects or certain examples that I've seen. And I want to share those insights that I've picked up and feel free to chime in at any time. But um, before you start, we start into like looking at examples, I, I think one of the things I started to lead into last time that I, I found to be quite valuable was the work that I had mentioned from the Heath brothers uh, about um, Made to Stick, right? Do you remember me mentioning that book, Made to Stick, last time? I think it was last time yeah so um i want to kind of get into that not just as a reference but some of the things that they talk about that uh in that book and their their models that they've developed so this is their website here and i'm going to share some links throughout the discussion tonight so this is the heath brothers website that's the book made to stick and one of the things that i think the core of really what they're talking about with that book is breaking out and explaining what call the principles of stickiness. Okay, so what are the characteristics or principles that make ideas sticky, relevant, memorable, etc.? Which is really what we're trying to do. We're trying to make things that stick with people. The first, so they call this model um, the success model. S U C C E S S, and big S. The last one is small s. So um, each one of the first letters is a part of an acronym. One, two, three, four, five, six principles. Okay, I'm just going to run through these, and then I'm going to give some examples of stuff that I've worked on that, you know, to some degree address these, and then in other cases, just there really was something that was was popped out. And I'm going to actually give visual examples of these projects. Um, so the first principle in their success model is simple. So th this is really about finding the core message that you're trying to communicate. You know, so if it's putting an economic value on externalities. I mean, you got to find that core simple message there for the, the audience that you're working with. Um, in, in our work in this realm of sustainable development in the environment, there's a lot of complicated problems to address uh, in, in our work. I'm working on, I have a presentation on, what is it, Friday, that I guess super complicated to um, the UN country team for, uh, for a monitoring and evaluation framework, but I've got 30 minutes to get through about seven months of worth of work. And so 
got to find ways to kind of distill down the simple messages that come out of that work. Ecological degradation, climate change, sea level rise, gender equality, all kinds of different issues are things that we deal with uh, in our work. But we cannot bombard people. That's the thing. I think I would advise you to think about when you're tasked with this, maybe if you have a board presentation or if you're working on a stakeholder engagement group for an EIA or whatever it is, determine what your core message is in the given situation. And in this, and this may mean limiting the scope of the issues that you deal with, you know, so you may be dealing with a really like one of these wicked problems that has a lot of dimensions to it, gender issues, you know, climate change, whatever. Um, but you might have to like narrow it down a bit and pick, okay, well, what are the things that I really want to stick here? What are those main things that I want people to walk away with? And I'll give you an example. The last example I will give you, um, is, is I did that. So, um, perfect example of one example of where they, they just really nailed this is uh, Earth, Earth Hour, right? Everybody familiar with Earth Hour, right? Yes, no? Who came up with Earth, Earth Hour? Whose idea was it? What was the organization that came up with that idea? Or at least developed it? Yeah, it's WWF. It's WWF gets credit for that. And We'll talk about them in a bit. WWF is very, very good uh, at this kind of work. They are excellent at it. Perhaps the most successful environmental campaign ever done, Earth Hour. Long lasting, it's been around for a long time. Well, you will have Earth Hour, you know, 20 years from now, guaranteed, right? Simple, it's a very simple thing. Turn out lights, save electricity, easy, okay? Principle number one, simple. Principle number two, unexpected. So this is another thing that works, and I've used this as well. Violate a schema, like get attention. You need to like break the norm sometimes and create the unexpected. So for example, you could say, come out and say, conservation will not work. We must use our resources. And you're doing this in a lead discussion to like a, a side event at the UN Convention for Biological Diversity, where everybody is saying like, well, we need to conserve, conservation, conservation, conservation. You could come and say conservation is BS, right? I mean, use drama, whatever, but I mean, the idea there is to break the schema. This won't work, conserving won't work. And in fact, I heard uh, Jane Goodall deliver a presentation. It was in 2016 at the COP conference in the Paris Climate COP. And she did that. She said, no, conservation doesn't work. And it was at the launch. And I mean, this is coming from one of the per people who has been, you know, at the, pretty much the center of conservation work for the last 20 plus years. Right. And the shift in their work has been more now towards in Africa, towards sustainable use and recognizing the needs of, of society for the economic use of natural resources. But, you know, really like the, the idea there is to sometimes just create the unexpected um, another way of doing this is to hold the attention of the audience with curiosity gaps, right? So for an example, what is by far the healthiest, uh, species is by far the healthiest on the planet, right? That could be a question you'd put out to the audience. Like what is the healthy species? And you, but you have to create some sort of curiosity gap. Like I, this is one I use a lot. So I use, in fact, I start classes with this, particularly environmental management. I used to do this in Concordia when I was teaching there uh, to the fourth year um, and, and the grad students for EIA. And I would say, I would start the first class, it was a class in environmental impact assessment. I said, who is the greenest prime minister in recent Canadian history? That was my curiosity gap, right? Who is it? And I'd say, what do you think? And of course, people came with, oh, Pierre Trudeau or did it. And, and, you know, and it's pretty irrefutable to, to not say that Brian Mulroney is the greenest prime minister in modern Canadian history based on based on achievements, like based on things, that, policies that were put in place during his tenure that actually made an impact. Right. And people are like, when I say Mulroney, they're just they're hit the floor. Right. Because many of those people weren't around then, like or they were young and they didn't get. But I mean, he's not that's not like what you envision when you think of a green prime minister. Right. You think of well, you think of Elizabeth May or you think of 
um, you name it, Al Gore, VP, et cetera. But the curiosity gap is important. You want to create intrigue, okay? So that's principle number two. Create the unexpected. Principle number three, concrete. C, concrete, S-U-C-C-E-S, -C -C -E concrete. Make the message understandable. So use sensory language. Often uh, people will paint a mental picture for the audience. Um, and like one of this is uh, um, one of the ones is used, is used was used quite a, a, with the JFK was we are going to put a man on the moon, right? Pa they painted the picture of progress and investment and innovation by envisioning at that time. So in the, I guess in the '60s, we are going to put a man on the moon, right? That one phrase allowed people to think of putting a person on the moon, which was unthinkable at the time. And it catalyzed the investment and the effort and the energy behind, you know, the space program, right? But a very simple message that is concrete, put someone up there and try and connect with multiple types of memory. So vivid description and visuals of pristine nature uh, is one thing that we could use. Um, example, like a great example of is um, why do people never tire of the image of the lone polar bear stranded on a tiny little iceberg, right? Why does that never, why does that never go out of style? Like when in doubt, pull out that image for climate change. If you're doing a thing on climate change, it's the bear. Yeah. It represents the Arctic. It represents strife. It usually the bear is kind of emaciated in a way. You know, if you see the bear in those, those images, they're kind of skin, uh, skinny. It's a metaphor. It's visual. It captures so many different things in one image that it is concrete, right? Memorable and it is sticky, right? Principle number three, make it concrete. Something that people can really grasp onto. And then my polar researchers hate that too. Like uh, George Wenzel, who's a, a for, uh, George Wenzel from McGill, is a polar guy. He hates that. Like he hates seeing that because you know, a lot of climate research on polar bears is misrepresented and he's an expert on it, right? So um, principle number four, the second C is credible. So then essential part of what we do in our business, you ha there has to be credibility. Um, and right now there's an immense amount of hyperbole, hyperbole on both sides of the kind of development versus environment argument, particularly on climate change. Okay, so the green movement has a tendency to exaggerate claims and sometimes misrepresent issues. Now, I've seen this personally. I'm not going to say that's always the case, but it happens, right? And you don't want that to happen because if you do that, uh, I've seen it. In fact, I've seen it done in an economic valuation of environmental services presentation in which they totally inflated the carbon values on this kind of an ecosystem valuation. And I heard the value. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, those are astronomical values based on what, you know, and it wasn't wasn't it wasn't credible like they instantly lost people um whereas the pro-development community does the opposite so they paint anyone who opposes development as an eco-freak right or in some cases as an un-canadian terrorist in some cases right um and so credibility then where does it come from right like we have to say okay well if we, we need to make sure that things are credible, how do we establish credibility? And it comes from outside. It can come from outside or it can come from within. So outside authorities validating the idea, right? So for instance, if you want to look at, I mean, and when you're writing uh, an eco-fascist, there you go. Uh, if you're, if you're um, kind of, if you're formulating a, a white paper or an argument or a presentation on climate change, I mean, the things you usually want to refer to are, are the most credible sources of information on that topic, right? And that tends to be the IPCC uh, for the science. And then for any kind of policy related stuff uh, globally, it would be the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And those are the kind of starting points and most trusted references for that kind of work. And they instantly establish credibility. So similarly, if you're dealing with biodiversity and ecosystems, you would look at IPBIS, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystems. Okay, so 
credibility will come from outside. Uh, and that, uh, like, you know, I work with the UN and in many cases, there's a sense of security and belief because of the perceived authority of the UN. Now that's interesting because, you know, that's called into question more often than not these days, right? You've seen this perfect examples with the WHO response to COVID-19. So I'm not saying that's the de facto kind of authority. And in fact, that's almost, there's a lot of pushback against that authority, quote unquote, now. So you got to be careful with how you establish what is, what is your source of credibility and not, but there are things out there that you, you, you need to refer to studies like, like, like well-cited studies in the area that you're, you're really talking about or working on. That's a good way to do it. Right. And a human scale statistics and vivid details can also help to realize credibility like, and so credibility, you can equate certain problems to human scale statistics or relative statistics and vivid details of what this like, you know, the classic one for climate change is we're going to take as many cars off the road as a result of this shift, right? So that's another way of kind of grounding or grounding the argument you're making. And it's also it's a good way of making it visual, that example. Principle number five, this is the second to last one, emotional. We are emotional creatures. Okay, so uh, people tend to care about people and not numbers. So um, example being uh, the tons of CO2 in the atmosphere or the increase in temperature. Um, you know, sometimes people get lost on that. Like uh, certainly if you're talking about PPM of CO2 or CO2 equivalents emissions or the uh, or concentration in the atmosphere or, or emissions from a site or a company, um, you lose the message sometimes when you use just the numbers, right? It, the numbers don't necessarily bring out an emotional response. And I found myself that same with the increase in temperature. Um, so you often will need to kind of weave that into some sort of emotional um, linkage, right? Whether it could be the suffering that some people might invoke or more importantly, um, what is the implication for your audience? I'm giving you an example of that as we go forward in the last examples. So uh, there's this acronym called um, w, uh, WIFI, W-I-I-F-Y. What's in it for you? What is the takeaway or implication for the audience? So whomever you're talking to, what does it mean to them? And frankly, self-interest can often be uh, uh domineer it, the dominant force uh in a lot of the audiences that you deal with particularly in business however self-interest can also be superseded uh by identity appeals right okay so appealing to the identity of the group that you're dealing with um uh know your audience in the accounting class we say the exact opposite but your audience is likely ceos and executives yeah, I'm going to get to an example of that, um, of a, um, I'll, I'm going to, I just going to, I got to exemplify that with, with, with one of the examples I'm going to talk about that we can't make really without empathy and emotion. Yeah. I mean, good point, Michelle. Uh, I, I think, I mean, emotion plays a role in, in all decisions that are made, like really at the end of the day. And, you know, if we're going to go into the economic world and, uh, you know, rational choice theory, um, you know, why, why is behavioral economics um, becoming so incredibly important in the world of economic research right now over the last, whatever, 10 years, right? It's like a tide shift. There is so much more attention being paid to behavioral economics. Why? Because, you know, it, it's not all about rational choice in economics. There's a lot of different factors that contribute to the choices, the economic choices people make. Okay. So, so for instance, here's an example. Self-interest can often be superseded by identity appeals. Like the Canadian thing to do is to be an environmental leader, right? If you're, if you're talking to, say, the Canadian Association of Mining Executives and you're talking about, um, you know, the, the necessity for considering batteries and ecosystems in, in accounting, right? Well, the Canadian thing to do is to be an environmental leader, right? Start with that. Boom. Right? We're Canadians. We're different, right? Identity appeal. That can really go a long way. 
Okay. And then lastly, principle number six. six. And this is probably my favorite one, which is um, stories. So stories. Stories drive action through simulation, like what to do and inspiration, motivation to do it. So you have to paint a picture through story of how an existing situation can change, right? So for the accounting world, you can look at case studies or, well, I mean, the classic one is, is, is interface carpets. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful story, right? Uh, and it's an amazing example to use now because the, the guy who, who made all that happen is relatively recently deceased, but his legacy lives, is, is large, right? Um, it's a powerful technique. And in fact, some people argue that story is the key to knowledge transmission and management. That's a, there's a whole kind of um, story area of research. Okay, so to, to, to then move forward on that. So how do we then, like, so that's the model, that's their model, that's not the only model, but there's elements of that that I think are really useful that I wanna exemplify through some examples. And first I wanna talk about story. So so how do we often uh, share some of our most memorable ideas, right? So when you come back from a trip, what do you do with your family or your friends? You stories, photos, but there's always a story associated with, oh, I got to tell you the story that goes with this photo, right? Or, you know, going out for a night or whatever it is, like stories are really, really an essential part of, of the transmission of, of, of knowledge and communication story myth, fable, even jokes. These are narratives that capture and transmit ideas in many cases, powerful messages, right? And long lasting messages. Aesop's fables, right? Greek mythology, um, First Nations oral history. What's another story that's pretty, pretty prominent? Fairy tales, what's the big one? What are some of the biggest ones? There we go. The Bible, the Quran, right? The, the, the stories that have lasted a long, long time. So many of these stories have serious moral messages embedded in them. So um, I'll, I won't go too far into this, but I, will, I do want to mention his works. I think it's interesting. Um, so from an analytical standpoint, if you want to look at, say, knowledge management, and which is closely related to communication. Um, one of the most um, kind of noted thinkers and scholars in this area over the past 10 to 20 years has been a gentleman by the name of Dave Snowden, Dr. Dave Snowden. Is anybody familiar with Snowden's work? Snowden? Good. I actually met him and saw him speak at where? Where do you think I met him and saw him speak? Wild guess. This amazing university where you're lucky to go to. And if you work hard in your class, yes, so Royal Roads. So Dave Snowden was a, I don't know if he was teaching, but this is a while ago. It's like 15 or so years ago. Um, I think he was guest lecturing or something like that, but he gave a talk to some of the staff and so forth. At, at the university, Steve Grundy was there, Tony, you know, the regular people. And, uh, and he gave a, a talk. He's a very crusty guy. You know, he's, he's a hardcore guy. I'll tell you that right away. Like he, he does for fools. You, you know, you want to like, you want to think before you speak when you're hanging out with uh, Dave Snowden, that's for sure. But his work's really interesting, you know, so um, he looks at narrative as intrinsic to organizational knowledge transmission. That's one of his big things. So one of his messages there is uh, that he was talking about is in order to find out the true story of what is going on in an organization, the thing you need to do is hang out at the water cooler. Hang out at the water cooler and hear what people are talking about. Why? Because that is where stories are being told. And that is where the story and the, the real knowledge of that organization is about how that organization is working is being transmitted. One area anyway. So he's formulated this 
theoretical framework, which he calls Kinefin, C-Y-N-E-F-Y-N-E-F-Y, yes. Uh, and it's a framework uh, that relates to how decisions are made in organizations based on knowledge, right? So I'm going to give you this YouTube, and I'll share this in the notes so you can take a look. So don't worry too much about writing anything down. But that link there um, takes you to a YouTube video, which, you know, he explains his Kinefin framework, which is, uh, that's a, um, he's from Wales, so uh, what's, I forget the language, they've Welsh, but something else, um, that they, it's, it's, it's a word from, you know, traditional language there. So it's a complexity model and a communication and, and understanding, uh, his argument is that communication and understanding is a complex system. Uh, it's a sense-making model as opposed to a categorization model. Um, a categorization model is where the framework precedes the data, like you have the framework and then you, you know, make sense of data with your framework. Whereas a sense-making model, the data precedes the framework. You have the data and then order and understanding comes uh, from, from, um, from, a, from seeing how the framework manifests itself in the data itself. So I'm, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to go too far into it, but look at that video. And basically he has four quadrants to um, uh, how systems and knowledge management works and says that it's rooted in narratives. And then we have um, the complex emergent uh, issues. So complex, the complex domain is where there's you probe, you sense, you respond, and ideas or the message emerges. You have the complicated, which is sense, analyze, and respond. That's the area, the domain of good practice. You have the simple, so sense, categorize, respond, which is like a database, and that. And then you have the chaotic, which is act, sense, and respond. So you have novel, uh, novel characteristics of the system. So I'm going to ask you after to take a look at that video and just kind of give it some thought and look at his work. Um, and it, it requires a bit of time to, 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 to really absorb what he's talking about, but I think it's worth your time to look at it for sure. But I'm not going to delve too far into it in this talk, because I want to talk about kind of more practical things this time around, because that's what I promised you. So what are some things that have worked, right? I've talked about, you know, principles and models and stuff. What actually works? So here's some things, first starting with some examples that, you know, I wasn't involved with, but... Um, have been really effective. So the first one is um, the Nestle versus uh, Gre Nestle versus Greenpeace campaign. I think I had mentioned this one to you before, but uh, for those that weren't there before, this is uh, one of the most effective environmental communications campaigns that I've seen. Okay, so um, this is the one where Greenpeace uh, identified that Nestle. Uh, was using palm oil sourced from unsustainable sources from Indonesia in Kit Kat bars. Are you familiar with this? The Kill Cat campaign? Anybody seen this before? You heard about it? Yeah? Um, it was hugely effective. And I would say you could pick out some of the principles that, um, that the Heath brothers used that, that really resonate here. One of which is story because they told the story and communicated the story of the orangutan. So the big issue is that uh, uh, palm plantations um, are developed in some countries, Indonesia being one, uh, and they are often um, created where there's virgin habitat for orangutans and other species. So they just chop it down, grow palm oil, process, palm, and process it and sell palm oil, right? So Greenpeace latched onto that, this and, you know, they turned it into the Kill Cat campaign. So they made a new chocolate bar and a new design for the cover that had a orangutan on it. And then they went off on that and they had like, you know, the, you, they developed an ad campaign where you open the chocolate bar and there's fingers of an orangutan in, in chocolate, where the chocolate bar is supposed to be, right? Uh, I, I, I'm not going to look at it, but probably. Um, if you Google this, uh, you'll find stuff. Like, I'm sure Nestle tried to clean all the imagery off the internet, but you can't get rid of this stuff. It's there for good. I've got a couple images in front of me right here, but there's there's ones like the one, I've got this one here, where they camped out in front of a Nescafe booth, and they're all dressed as orangutans. They got orangutan suits, and, um, and you know, the media attention was dramatic, big time. 
Nestle, and Nestle to give rain ask Nestle to give reinforce your break, Nestle killer, the, the kill cat bar, right? So what happened as a result of this? As soon as it came out, it went viral. So this is the early era of social media. It took off and um, immediately Nestle Force was, to, was forced to re-examine its, uh, the guy just bit each other. Oh my God. I, okay. That's not one that I've seen. <laughs> no, they didn't go that. I don't know if that might take off because I don't think Greenpeace would go that far. No, they don't push it that far usually. Um, how as an NGO do you print illegally against Nestle if you did something like that? Um, good question. Like in terms of uh, slander or, or legal, like in that sense? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I think I, I can't tell you. Like I really can't. I think you've got to be careful about, I think you have to be factual with your, uh, with your critiques. That's number one. Make sure that you're not just, um, you know, you're not slagging for no reason. Um, make sure you do your homework. Um, but Greenpeace gets away with it. Like Greenpeace is a, very good at, at taking that stuff on. And the Greenpeace has also got, you know, they're fairly, fairly courageous uh, with what they do. So sometimes I just don't think they, ca they care, actually. You know, they, you know, they were driving boats, you know. They, they've done things that are somewhat called reckless, but they're, you know, they're, they're doing it for their higher purpose. My point here is that the, the communications the techniques that they employed with that campaign caused Nestle to um, fire the suppliers that they had. And in fact, to give them some credit, Nestle didn't appear to be aware of the full ramifications of what they were doing. At least, you know, that's what the story was. And so they then shifted to um, uh, a more sustainable source of palm oil. They started re responsible uh, palm oil standard and to this day are growing their proportion of the palm oil that they use that comes from sustainable sources. So it really had a big impact, right? And part of that has to do with the fact that they went direct, Greenpeace went direct to the market. Direct to the market, it's a business in which it's a customer facing business. You walk into a store and the kid says, I want a Kit Kat. But then the day late, the, the, that, that, that evening before the, they had seen this Kill Cat commercial and the kid said, I never want to have a Kit Kat again, right? It's that kind of, that's where the decision is made at the consumer level. And it's an important thing to understand. Um, so therefore, it's, those t campaigns really have an effect at that level. Similarly, on the other side, where you have companies that are doing great things, that are consumer oriented companies, they really want the consumer to know about that, like the Pumas and the Levi's and so forth. Okay, so you want to come up with campaigns that stick and this stuck. They used story, they made it emotional, uh, they made it quite simple too, like it was a simple campaign, you know, we're killing orangutans, that's simple. So, good manifestation of um, how the, um, the model can work. I mentioned already Earth Hour, super effective, okay? Amazing, good visuals. If you Google some of the things that WWF does on their Earth Hour um, visual campaigns, fantastic, fantastic work, okay? So now I wanna shift to talk about some kind of um, projects that I have personally seen some success and some, some failure at. And this is from my own kind of career in communications and design. All right, so, um, and, and the idea there is, all of these projects have sustainability as part of the communications objective. The first one goes back 20 years now. So the first project, and I'm gonna put through some links, uh, and I can share some imagery in the handout as well, um, or in the notes that are downloadable um, for you, so you can get a better handle on what this what what the actual projects look like okay but for the time being i'm just going to put through some links to uh, the project on the website okay first one 20 years ago in germany hanover uh at expo 2000 okay so i'm just going to put through this link here you can take a look at this and take a look at it more in your spare time but so the idea here and this is a project where i actually kind of started my design career working on this one it's a landmark event. So it was a, in, in the world of expos, you have A class, B class, and C class world expos. 
An A class means lots of money is spent and a lot of investment and a lot of attention is brought to that expo. B, less so, and C, less so. So this was an A class expo, expo, meaning they're expecting lots of people and got a fair amount of attention. It was in May of 2000, and the focus of this um, project was um, the, or the expo was sustainable development, humankind, nature, and technology. Okay, that was the overall theme of the expo. So everything that in that whole world expo related to that theme in some way, shape, or form. Okay, so I was working for a company that was Vancouver based and we were um, producing content for two of the pavilions in the theme area. So they had a theme park, they call it in German or a theme park, where they had each pavilion had a, a, a topic that they were supposed to kind of represent. So the, the, the two pavilions that, that we worked on were the humankind pavilion and the energy pavilion. Now I work more on energy, so on producing content uh, and, and working with a team, it wasn't just me, it was a team of designers and graphic designers and filmmakers and all this kind of stuff to um, create content in this big, huge pavilion, it's a big one, um, pertaining to various forms of energy and how we use it, renewable energy, clean coal, wind, ge geothermal, hydro. And the idea here was to show the social and technical aspects of energy to the general public and have them kind of understand some of the trade-offs that, that, that existed. So Germany is a great place for something like this. because Germany has some great examples of small communities have adopted renewable energy. Uh, and, you know, in Freiburg is one place where they have solar powered libraries and all this kind of stuff. And that's 20 years ago. Now there's, they've got even more advanced stuff. So we use that. And the idea there was to kind of get people really thinking critically about that. And even coal, we, we had, some uh you live in freiburg okay there you go so um freiburg is we had a uh, on freiburg uh very advanced and very interesting partnership because they did that through a, a quite an innovative public partner public public private partnership and um so we showcased freiburg at that at that expo one of the areas where we showed about solar right also geothermal we had some israeli geothermal plants that we're showcasing um all kinds of different stuff and um, and even coal, we had uh, call it clean coal or brown coal because Germany has a lot of brown coal and they've developed a lot of technology to reduce emissions from using coal to produce uh, electricity. So we had kind of brown coal stuff as well. And um, so the idea with this though, and this, this is kind of the message that came out of this project is production value matters. Right, especially at this type of um, event, you have to put the energy and resources into good production value. Make stuff look good. So, like, get a good designer. Sometimes, if you have to spend a bit of extra time on making the visuals look good and the production value, right? Put some music to your film, film whatever. Like, you know, the production value is important. Now, it's really important if you're working in a World Expo. And this is my first professional project in this area. So, you know, having a German client as your first kind of as a producer for your first big international design project is not the best idea because they are, it was really stressful. They're super demanding and it just, you know, it was stress. It was, it was a, it was a tough, tough, <laughs> it's a tough four months or more, six months. Okay. Production value though, make stuff look good, make it feel good presented in a way that people uh, are like there's aesthetic it's aesthetically pleasing okay that is important i've seen it many many times since then next project with a different lesson this was in saudi arabia okay so i'm going to push through this link now and in fact i was recently over there i was over there a couple few months ago um looking at this very project which i hadn't seen live before because uh, we cut off trips there because of 9 11 um, and it looked great and now you know doing stuff with them again it looks like so this project here was called the sultan bin abdulaziz science and technology center so this was a science and technology center that was uh, 200,000 square or sorry 300,000 square feet at the time it was the biggest science center in the middle east had five galleries covering a variety of topics from marine life 
like kind of big aquarium space, uh, biological life on Earth, technology, and so forth, um, with very different interactive exhibits, graphics, films, computer interactive exhibits, uh, and and live exhibits and stuff. This is produced in Arabic and English, so we did this um, in Vancouver. Actually, we produced everything in Vancouver and then had it localized and had the Saudis come over and review everything, and then we had it deployed in Kobar, Saudi Arabia for Prince Sultan. So Prince Sultan, Prince Sultan, he was now deceased, was the, his foundation was the client. Okay, so what's the big deal about this one? Aside from it being a really big project, a lot of stuff just from a production standpoint, really tricky, um, distinct cultural challenges. There were some pretty big ones with this one. So for instance, evolution doesn't exist, right? So evolution is something we take for granted as Western thinkers or Western scientists and so forth. There, it was a non-starter, like we did not mention it. In fact, it was was so not, to not be mentioned that we we even had to change one of the exhibits on, um, on, on plate tectonics, like which is not evolution, because we referred to change over geological time and they interpreted that as evolution and they said, no, like evolution is wrong. It's, it's not, it's speculative. It's, violates the what's taught to us in the Quran, and so don't include it. I'm like, ooh, okay. Um, so cultural sensitivity, uh, gender roles, big issue, big issue when you have your senior producers who are all women, and then uh, when the, these fellows come into the room, and they were all guys who are the clients, and when lunch comes, you know, we had to separate for lunch, and at first, you, the women could not be addressed directly because that's not how it works in Saudi Arabia. They had to have a guy, you know, address them to, to speak about whatever they're. So you, you can imagine that this was like very tricky. It's, it's in no way, shape or form what we believed uh, on our side and how we worked at all. Um, however, so it was tricky at first. The first meetings were like awkward. Um, but with time, the good part is uh, with time, uh, the work came out. It could just just became irrelevant whether you're a woman or a man a year into that project because if you're producing great work, I mean, that, that's the only thing that mattered, right? So a lot of those issues kind of just sort as we got to know each other and got more, um, I guess, more sensitized to each other's cultures. We were understanding about them. Hold like like shaking hands, have a meeting. That's a no-no. Like that didn't change for for the Saudi men to our like the women on our production team. And that was just the way a cultural norm for them. Okay. Um, the idea for this project was to, to educate about sustainability in the environment in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia of all places. Right. But they are very, very pro environment, uh, pro biodiversity. Um, the climate change topic was somewhat avoided in that, uh, 2001, right. That's a long time ago. So, whereas now they're all over it, right? Why? Because it was snowing when I was there last in January when I was in Saudi Arabia, it was snowing in Saudi Arabia in the Northern part of Saudi Arabia. It's never happened before. And it was on the news and they're like, what is it? So, I mean, they get it. Uh, same with the UAE, same with Oman and other Middle Eastern countries. Climate change is understood there and accepted. So, um, what was the, what's the real takeaway here? Uh, from kind of a, a kind of communication standpoint, cultural context, you know, cultural context is extremely important. Now, in this case, there was a lot of dimensions to that, how we interpreted the science, how we dealt with certain issues or didn't deal with certain issues, um, how we dealt with interpersonal issues, like the kind of the, the actual nuts and bolts of working together were quite a bit different. Um, however, cultural context really uh, plays a role in, in many different projects, in my projects all the time. Um, if we're working in the Caribbean or elsewhere, I mean, there's things that, you know, we need to understand when we're doing the presentations or we're crafting communications. Cultural context will really influence how we position certain topics and, and communicate them, okay? Cultural context, very important to understand where you're, what you're, who you're communicating to and in what context you're going to be communicating and, and adapt accordingly. Get to know a bit about the culture you're working in that will save you a lot, the language particularly. Okay, culture, super important. TELUS Spark was the next one I want to talk about. So this is a project that I worked on in Calgary. It was the first purpose-built science center in 20 years in Canada. 
um, took a distinct approach. Um, in this project, new, typically what you get for these kind of challenges is you just, you know, they say we want this and you go and like sit down with the designers and you sketch some stuff uh, and then you come up and you present either some schematics or whatever and then they like it, they don't like it, they change it, you go build it, it's done. End of story. Whereas in this case, it had a unique situation in which we had a fair chunk of money from the federal and provincial and municipal governments, which allowed us to do a lot of experimentation. So they allowed us to pilot things, or, and I really think this is important, to create experiments, right? So what we did with these kind of communications experiences is we'd say, okay, we want to, I don't know, we want to show things about the sky, right? Or, or whatever, um, electricity. We would sit around and have a session where we'd think about different ways of showing that and then come up with ideas and then um, pick of the 10 ideas and then we'd start with the experience and say, well, why don't we like bang on things or whatever? It was so different than what I was used to. I usually start with content and get to like the experience. In this case, we started with the experience and got to content. But we would kind of come up with like 20 ideas. We'd pick five of them and we'd go and build them rough, like plywood and stuff like this and rough it out. And, uh, and then we go to a place, I don't know if anybody here is online, is from Calgary, uh, something called the Market Collective. Do you know what the Market Collective is? Anybody there? The calm? Yeah? Okay. So we went to the Market Collective and we had a part of the Market Collective where they gave us some space to have those pilot exhibits. And so what we did is we put them up and then we had the guests, like the people who come to the Market Collective, just kind of mess around with them. And, and we would observe them to see what worked and what didn't work which was great. So we did it in the Market Collective and also at the Old Science Center. We had two different sites for doing that times. And this was phenomenal. Why? Because, you know, when you're as experts or designers, or like as experts in this case, um, we, we, we're so familiar with our stuff that we think everybody else is familiar with our stuff. In the design world, you are, you get stuck on your ideas. You think, oh, man, this is a great idea. This is going to look cool, blah, blah, blah. And you sell yourself on the idea before you sell other people. Well, in this case, it was so humbling because, I mean, mo a lot of my ideas, they just stunk, right? They were stinkers, failures, total failures. We, we roughed it out, put it together, and I, was all too, I got too stuck in the complications of things. Oh, we should show da 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 this. And we'd get through and we'd, like, we'd put these things up and people come and they're like, blah, blah, okay, and they walk away. Like, we had the opportunity to test and pilot and see what worked and prototype stuff. So, uh, and... I'll give an example. A thing that was like fantastically successful was this one on, on the thunderstorm station is best. Yeah, that's a good one. I remember we came up that one. That was Chris, another guy who came up with that one. So entertaining and simple. The other one's very successful is the um, sedimentary layers one. If you go into the earth and sky gallery there, there's this one where you take beads and sand and stuff and you pour it in the top and there's like this two sheets of plexiglass and you can create um sedimentary like you create the strata right um i remember when we came up with that you know chris and i came up with that and i thought oh this sucks you know this isn't going to work you know it's just boring right the thing that's good about that is it's highly visual and it's it and people can do it together so when we did that at the market collective we piloted that built it we built a rough model of it chris and i and then we then or mostly chris and i actually think we did that one together and then we, we, we put that up. I'm like, okay, we had the buckets out with the sand. And then people came and like, you know, people were crazy about it. They like, wow, they'd, the parents would grab their kids or lift up their kids. They give them a bucket of sand or beads, lift them up to the top so they could pour it in. The kid would win one. The other kid would watch as it went down and start to form the strata. And then all day it would build and build and build. And then people would saw that at the end of the day, there's this community art piece that was created right because that's what i think that's how it works now at the uh at this, the science center and collective interactive people do it together visual simple um concrete boom made to stick that's a sticky idea right worked like a charm a huge winner one of the most successful exhibits i've seen ever okay so what's who cares like what does this mean for stuff we're talking about which is not science centers um is um, what we did with this project is like some challenges where I'll get to the, the key point here in a bit. Climate change was not squarely addressed in that project, right? They just, 
you know, they didn't want to make it a preach environment. What they did emphasize, though, was a sense of place over and over and over again. You get that a lot if you go there. Like, we are in Alberta. We are Calgarians. This is our place. You get that. Um, but we reversed the design process. We went from experience to content. And the lessons learned were iterate, experiment, and fail. Right? Iterate, experiment, and fail. So in your work, allow some time to fail. And don't feel bad about it. I'm telling you, I failed miserably. And I got paid fairly well for, <laughs> for failing on that project. It was funny. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh, my ideas suck. But, you know, we're getting paid, well, so it's okay. But, you know, like, it's okay. Like, failure is part of a design process. And it's part of good communications. So allow some time and allow some room for iteration and experimentation, too. Try some different things. You never know what's going to happen. Like that sedimentary layer project. I saw that first one like, oh, I don't know, whatever, you know, it might work. And it was a huge hit. Okay. Um, I'm going to rush these ones. Okay. I've got a couple more. Um, actually, I'm going to skip this one. Yeah, I'm going to skip one. I'm going to just got two more because I don't want to keep too long. Real plus 20. Okay. Um, this was a project in, in 2012 uh, in Rio de Janeiro. And it was the, uh, we designed the Rio Conventions Pavilion. This was the pavilion where the, um, oh, sorry, I'm going to put this through to you so you can see. Uh, this was a very, very big learning experience. A lot of interesting kind of insights from this project. It's the 20th anniversary of the Rio Summit, which occurred first in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, uh, which was basically when the Climate Change Convention started, UNFCCC, the UNCBD, the Convention for Biodiversity, and UNCCD, the Convention for Combating Desertification, all started at the Rio Summit. Hence, they're called the Rio Conventions today, right? So this was the 20th anniversary of that conference, Rio plus 20. 20 years from the Rio Summit, sustainable development became mainstream. How are we doing, right? It was depressing, mostly because people were like, look, our greenhouse gas emissions are going pretty high. Biodiversity is getting emaciated throughout the world. I mean, 20 years hasn't really given us a lot of good progress on this front. It's kind of a wake up call, actually, I think, for a lot of people, Rio plus 20. Um, and um, basically, the Rio Conventions Pavilion, um, it was not in the official area. So there's, there's there you have typically you have where all the, the delegates go and sit in their chairs and debate over text and all that kind of stuff. That's usually in most of these places is like closed off from the public unless you're like an NGO or, or you're a delegate, like a focal point country person or whatever, um, or business you can go to if you get certified. Um, but then this was in the general public area. So everybody had access to it, which was great. Um, it was secured, but it was you could you could get into it. And in this area of this Rio Summit, they had um, uh, a lot of different kind of pavilions and stuff going on, uh, which was fantastic and it was super. It was great. And this pavilion that we designed was for discussions on the Rio conventions. And so over the 14 days of this conference, we had each day devoted towards a certain theme, like it's oceans, forests, whatever, business, uh, gender. And these, we had a series of presentations that would be like the OECD presentation on this, WWF on this, um, the African Development Bank on, I don't know, whatever, on forests, that kind of stuff. So it was an environment for that to occur. And that was what our task was to create a welcoming environment for policy and as well as the general public. So we took a really interesting approach. I'll send you the visuals. I won't go through it right now. I thought we had a good color scheme and blah, 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 made it interactive. Okay. So we had people where the opportunity where people can write on stuff on the walls and leave their message for the world for sustainable development. Right. So one of these messages I have in front of me here on these leaves that we allowed people to write on and change was save the world now, please. This is from someone named Elaine from Rio de Janeiro. Right. And then this, this other image I've got here, which you'll see is, is Jesus save us. Right. Um, so all kinds of like, but the th thing there was to allow participation. So the thing that was interesting about this project uh, that was that it attracted a lot of the senior bigwigs in sustainable development, like all the ministers of environment and, you know, and whatever, Jeff Sachs and these kind of people. But it also brought a lot of kind of popular pe popular culture to it, right? So um, what we found was uh, aesthetics matter. 
right? We've talked about this before. We had to make this a really slick environment. Um, we, uh, we, the other thing that really rung through with this project was, and I'll give an example, was star power. Okay. In this, um, when we went to like, when I went to the senior level discussion on climate change in Africa, you had the head of climate change for the African Development Bank. You had the head of climate change for uh, whatever WWF, like senior big shots in the morning, 10 a.m., talking about what they're doing. There was five people in the audience, right? These are the people like they're the key people in the world on that topic. No one there. It was a little early. I'll give them credit, but like that's part of the re reason why. So, and that was a frequently occurring phenomenon. Like we had some, like killer like content, people who really knew their stuff, and they had like I don't know marginal participation of people who kind of you know uh, work in the field and stuff like that. I loved it because it was you know stuff I work on. However, um, on one of the days while I was leaving, you know, I was there for the whole time and the client was the UN, the UN Environment Program, just to make sure everything went smoothly. And uh, my client, as I was going, she said, oh, well, uh, you're, and I was training in the morning. I trained, I was in Copacabana, I took the bus out. I'd do jiu-jitsu in the morning at 6 a.m. And then, and, then and then I'd go to the site, do that stuff all day. So like, come for, I'm tired. I want to go, I want to chill out back in Copacabana, which is about half an hour away or 40 minutes away by bus from the city. I'm tired. I'm leaving. I'm like, okay, that's another successful day. I am tired. I want to go. And then the client says, why are you saying for Miss Universe? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, uh, yeah, Miss Universe is coming. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll stay. And that should be interesting. And so out of the blue, this black car comes ripping up and out steps this six foot two stunning Angolan woman who was Miss Universe that year. Um, her name is, I forget her name, um, but uh, Miss Angola, and Leila, Leila, Leila Lewis, I think her name is Leila something. Leila Lopez, that's it. And uh, she she was the goodwill ambassador for the UNCCD, the, the kind of like the Angelina, Angelina Jolie for refugees. That was her role for desertification. So why do I mention this, right? Is it because we should all worship supermodels? No. The thing is, when she came and then Edward Norton came, because he's the good ambassador for the Biodiversity Convention, when those people came to that pavilion, that place filled up like you wouldn't believe. It was overflowing with people. The media went nuts. Like the media just flowed in there. And social media, you saw that pavilion spike like big time. Like I said, the, the people I know at the UN who work on that stuff, they said, oh my gosh, we're, we're, we're trending on social media right now. So one of the takeaways there is, um, is star power does increase reach, you know, like that kind of popular appeal does increase reach on this kind of content. Now, I'm not saying that we need to have to have Leonardo DiCaprio or whomever, or Neil Young or whatever, you name it, you name the star to kind of really get people to think about stuff. Um, I think it's an important, it can be a good tool to use on occasion and not always like sometimes credibility can be an issue, right? But I can tell you in this circumstance that to get reach on what we were doing, that was really, really useful. And Edward Norton was phenomenal. He talked about biodiversity. Peter Kent was our environment minister for Canada at the time. He shared the stage with him and I listened to their presentations on biodiversity and Edward Norton schooled him. Like he was so well versed on the nuances of the biodiversity policy, access and benefit sharing, all the really complicated stuff he knew about. He had clearly done his homework and he did a tremendous job. So Edward Norton, like, wow, incredibly impressive as a, as a kind of a spokesperson. Okay. So the last example, I'm taking, keeping you a long time tonight, but I swear this last one is going to be worth it. The last one, this appeals mostly, I think relates mostly to those that are in 560 and around environmental accounting, is a presentation that I was hired to give in Mexico for the GIZ. So it was the German equivalent of uh, Pamela Anders was involved in the anti-fish farm came in BC last year. Kind of weird perspective. So yeah, you know, I mean, I know she's big into PETA and so forth, but you know, I mean, if that can work, then I guess you know, that's one way to get reach, right? Um, not always, you know, you, you got to be careful with it, all right, because you're relying on personality and people's appeal. And if you choose the wrong person, then 
you know, maybe it might backfire, you know, it might not work. Um, and you don't want to, yeah, I wouldn't have Jane Fonda. And, you know, if I were doing like a, a, an innovation summit for, um, in Alberta for energy, I would not bring Jane Fonda and Neil Young as keynote speakers, you know, I just wouldn't do it because like you know, people would throw things wouldn't be, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be benefit. I would bring like, I don't know, Elon Musk, right? So people are like, okay, I'll go. I listen to Elon Musk for sure. Like your hardest core oil executive would listen to what Elon Musk has to say for sure. Guaranteed. So, um, the last one, this is the biggie. I used a lot of those techniques I talked about earlier in this last presentation. I was really nervous about it. So I was hired by the GIZ. GIZ is the German equivalent of the CEDA, which is the Canada International Development Association, although it doesn't really exist anymore, but they're aid agency, Germany's aid agency. And they do a lot of aid work. Germany does a lot of aid work, particularly in the environment, lots of climate change stuff. So I got connected with them and they hired me to go to Mexico because I found out about the stuff that my team and I work on to do a presentation to the Mexican Banking Association, okay, in Mexico City to talk about um, the a role of biodiversity and ecosystems in banking to present to them, okay? So, and these are like the senior execs from Banorte, Banamex, um, the big banks, right? Those would be like the Royal, that would be the Royal Bank and the CIBC or whatever and, and uh, TDs of, of Mexico. So I went to to this and um, I was thinking to myself, okay, how do I appeal to these people? Like, how do I really sell the idea of the importance of factoring in biodiversity and ecosystems into, you know, banking and business, their business really, which is, you know, financing stuff. And um, so I thought about it a lot and I, I presented, I developed kind of, I first painted the context and gave them like kind of the background, the tipping point stuff. So I established credibility to start with by first presenting the state of science on biodiversity and ecosystems globally and the good research and that kind of thing. And then with that, they said, okay, well, this is interesting. Like we know now that biodiversity is in trouble internationally, according to this paper of the leading scientists and so forth. But then at that point in the presentation, because I wanted to make it resonant with, resonate with them, I said, well, why is this important? And this was in Spanish too. Uh, and they said, uh, I said, who cares? Who cares about this stuff? So this is in 2016. That's when this project was uh, early into, or sorry, fall, September-ish, something like that, 2016. I said, who cares? And then the next slide I showed, I wish I had, could have the visual to show you here. I'll include this in the notes, is this big shot of Trump. Um, and he is, uh, he's, he's, he's one where he's staring. So I showed Trump. I said, Trump cares. And this is at the time, right, where the election is in full swing and Trump is running on building a wall between Mexico and the United States. That's one of his main things, right? And these are the some of the political elites of Mexico who detest him. And so I'm coming there as a foreigner saying, and you need to think of who cares about this stuff. Donald Trump cares about biodiversity and ecosystems banking. And as soon as I put that image up, because it's one of the classic ones, everybody, the jaws were like, what are you like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> it's time for you to leave right now. Just kind of like, what are you talking about? That kind of thing. But it was, I did it. Why did I do that? I wanted to create um, kind of an unexpected situation and a curiosity gap. What are you talking about? Like, what is this guy talking about? And I said, uh, and I got into the data and I talked about the fact that ignoring biodiversity and ecosystems and the data associated with it, particularly in countries like Mexico, South America, the Caribbean, where I do a lot of my work, is preparing you for failure and preparing you for financial losses. Because if you are investing in agricultural farmers, which they do, they lend a lot of money to the ag sector, and you have no idea what the risk of flood or drought or you know infestations can be on some of those people that you're lending money to, you might as well be ready to like, you know, like roll the dice and see what happens. 
And so I circled back to the next plane with a lot of data and showed them kind of the drought risk parameters that, and, and model output and so forth that we use. And I said, like, Trump cares, not because he cares about the environment, but he cares about losses. That's the one thing that we can safely say about Donald Trump, especially at that time, is he cares about losses in general, losing particularly financial losses. And, and so I framed the biodiversity and ecosystem issue, not as a kind of a, you should do this type of thing as a kind of virtue signaling saying, this is the right thing to do. This is the thing you need to do to protect your downside risk and to uh, limit the exposure that you have as companies, as financial organizations, to some of the major th major impacts that we're seeing right now and that we're expecting to happen. And, and then cited some of the things that are happening with droughts in northeastern Mexico or northwestern Mexico and so forth. And boom, the light went on and on. They're like, ah, so you're talking about risk analysis. I go, that's correct. Biodiversity and ecosystems in banking is 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 about risk analysis and that was it sold they got it like, okay well how do we do this then and then i went into some case studies and examples so the moral of that story was create the unexpected and create some emotional drama even anger actually in this case or like distaste for what i was talking about it worked and it worked like a charm to this day they remember that presentation Okay, so to recap then, um, there are some principles that the Heath brothers talked about that I think are useful and the things that I've talked about that you'll see in these notes that I think can be helpful for you. But what I wanna leave you with is that communicating these ideas and the hardcore work that you'll be doing in accounting and in scientific analysis and so forth is not something that should be taken lightly. You really need to spend some time on the comm side because it can make or break your project. Okay, uh, spend the time and spend the energy and allocate some time for experimentation and, and iteration and allow yourself to fail. So don't like test your 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 presentations and you know your campaigns. Do a beta of the campaign and test it with your own staff just to see how people perceive it because it may be good to you. Like me, my stuff with the Telus project, I thought it was fantastic. And it was horrible, like it just didn't work. Some of them, not all of them, but a lot of them. So be, and feel comfortable with that. Feel comfortable, but build it into your process, I'd say, okay? So that's all I have to say. I went a little long, I'm sorry, but um, questions, up to you. Yeah, that's a biggie. There was a lot there. And you'll see it in the notes. I'll post the notes. I'll try and put the, the images in the in the websites too that you can go to. There's a lot to this stuff. That's what I'm saying. Like and, and for 586, you're at the point of the course where this is really important. It's where you integrate stuff together, right? So think about the role of communications in in kind of um, in reconciling some of these issues that we've dealt with and going forward in in being change. Uh, okay, I don't know. I don't know that, of course, but I, I'm, I'm glad. Yes, yeah, because a bunch of us are also getting Oh, okay, cool. Good. I'm glad that I didn't know. Like, I don't know what's going on else. I'm in my own world. So hopefully that's kind of helps, helps you out. Jason. So, I mean, these are practical things too. I mean, this isn't theoretical. Like a lot of the stuff I was talking about is just stuff I've done. I mean, trust me, when you get your German client, he's like the best designers in the world. We're working on those projects, freaking out. Um, you learn very quickly that production value is important, you know? So, um, yeah, but but I mean, those Heath principles are good. I, I take a look at them. Eddie, Eddie Vedder is on this? Oh my God. I can't believe Eddie Vedder is on my podcast live. Uh, um, yeah, the, I mean, just the way the cookie has crumbled, a lot of the stuff that I've worked on is international, but this applies just as much to doing a presentation at Toastmasters in Victoria, right? Like, it's no different at all. When I started teaching at Concordia, I used a lot of this stuff and experimented at first and did that for five years. And 
you know, uh, tested the ideas and they really, they, it works in education and teaching as well, I found. I don't do a lot of in-person teaching these days, just just the way things are, you know, with, uh, with my work. But if I were to do that, I would definitely use a lot of this stuff. Yeah, cons is super important. And in, when I started my, my university education in, in engineering and systems engineering, we always used to make fun of designers and design saying, oh, it's not important, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no way design can make a company, right? The amount of time that Apple spends on product design is incredible, or Tesla, incredible, right? So factor it in to your projects and your work. ICLE, cool, we're hosting one on Climate Camp next Tuesday. Oh, great, ICLE, great organization, right? So NGOs, big part of your work is communications, right? WWF, killing it. Greenpeace, you know, I'm not the number one fan of Greenpeace, you know, like I, I respect what they do and I see the importance of it, but I don't like, you know, I'm not hanging out with them all the time. Uh, I will post that link for the ICLE one. Oh, or Jenny, you can do it too. Uh, but they do a good job doing work for Yes, uh, yeah, do work in private sector, mostly not a lot right now. Um, uh, private sector stuff I have done has been for Bell, uh, mostly in the context of um, CSR, communicating that kind of stuff. Um, some of the things I was going to show were private sector oriented. I'm trying to think of the last private sector thing that's ongoing, but yes, the answer is yes. And in fact, for the private sector, I didn't show a lot of private sector stuff, but it's it's a very important part of it. And you'll see some of the examples if you're uh, in which course you're you're in, but or any course. But the um, the the Puma is a good example of effective communications in the private sector. They've done really good stuff. There's a lot of good examples of private sector companies that are doing great environmental communications, if you will. So yeah, yes, definitely not a ton at this exact moment, but in in general, yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm ambivalent to the organization. It's like, do you have, what's the project? You know, what do you want to do? You know, what's the timeline? What's the objectives? What's the budget? And then we can figure it out. My team is very adaptable. So we just, you know, we're doing stuff with First Nations Fisheries Council right now, starting to. So NGOs, sure, that's how I started with NGOs. All right, so that's a biggie. I knew it was going to be a biggie. Sorry, but, you know, it's important. It's a lot of important stuff. I'm glad it was useful. And so you will be able to download the PDF, which summarizes a lot of these concepts, and the images I'll include in that. And you can refer to the website, and I'll have those links in the PDF, which will be in the description of the of the video on YouTube, which I will we'll try and get up tonight, if not tonight, tomorrow, and I will send out that link. You have it already, but I'll send it over again. So take a look at that PDF. That will be helpful for you um, as you are confronted with these kind of challenges in your own work. Okay, all good. Yeah, this stuff really is happening. That's the other thing I like about it, is we are not talking theory all the time. We deal with reality at railroads.